Hey Lakmal, good to talk to you today, especially about the, the recent uh, blog post you have written, which had lo- lots of views, even my repost had lots of views as well, more than 10,000. Um, you know, the title says, Unlocking the Power of Programmable uh, Data Planes in Kubernetes with eBPF. So let's talk, uh, you know, a few things about it. First of all, I think it's important for us to tell people who are new to eBPF or some people may have not known about eBPF. Maybe a quick summary about what is this eBPF about? Sure, Kanjan. Yeah, uh, in simple terms, eBPF is a tool that allows us to add custom features to the Linux kernel without changing the kernel's original code. Mm -hmm. You can think of it as adding hooks into the kernel's operation. These hooks get triggered by certain actions like system calls or network events, etc. For instance, EP5 can peek into a system call like read or write made by a program. It can also look at or change network packets, make custom network rules, or collect network stats. Uh-huh. Right. Similarly, and it can also monitor action on file like open, read, or write. Uh, this helps to keep eye on like on the file access, set access rules, or collect data on input output action, and so on. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. And and I think we should also elaborate what the eBPF stands for. You and I probably know, but maybe the, a lot of the community would. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, BPF originally stood for Berkeley Packet Filter, but mm-hmm. now that eBPF extended BPF can do so much more than the packet filtering. And the acronym no longer makes sense. So eBPF is now considered a standalone term, but doesn't stand for anything. I see. I see. Thanks. Um, is eBPF safe? Because it's talking to the kernel and making, you know, listening. Acceptance. Yeah, so, this is a common yeah. question. Yeah. I think absolutely. eBPF is designed to, to save in use in production environment. Mm-hmm. So I can give two reasons. Right, right. Uh, firstly, EP5 program are checked or verified by a Git compiler before they use into the kernel. I see. Uh, and also this verification ensure the program is safe and won't harm the system. And secondly, uh, EP5 programs run in their own virtual machine in the kernel. This means uh, they are isolated, so they can't negatively affect the rest of the systems. Right. So it's pretty uh, okay to say it's safe to use in, in, in production as well, right? Yes, I think. Yeah. Okay. Perhaps you could also elaborate a little bit more with the, the article you wrote in programmable data planes in Kubernetes means in terms of sure. the, yeah, in terms of Kubernetes. Yeah. So programmable data plane is a concept. Uh, it's not specific to the Kubernetes, but mm-hmm. applies to a network in general. Um, so uh, uh, we can think of like a programmable data plane uh, as a smart and flexible network system. Unlike the old way, so we, where you had a manual adjust settings on a specific equipment like routers, mm-hmm. this new method uses software to control the network. So right. it's more flexible, can grow easily, and it works on normal equipment. So no need any anything fancy, uh, and in the world of Kubernetes, is mm-hmm. it uses an easier way to control network using things like deployments, ports, services, and more. And also yeah. uh, by using uh, tech like uh, EPPF alongside these simpler controls, we can make a strong adjustable network system and that can easily adapt to the new cloud applications needs. I see, thanks. Um, how can eBPF be used uh, in to improve the performance and scalability of Kubernetes applications? Okay, uh, to answer this question, uh, I will need to like uh, delve into some technical aspects. Uh, let me attempt to give a concise explanation. Sure. Uh, uh, in in Kubernetes, a service used to a steady virtual IP and a port number, and right. representing a group of ports. 
this IP doesn't tie to a physical interface, but it gives a consistent endpoint for a service. If a client send a data to this IP and port, mm -hmm. a network proxy, we call it co-proxy, on each right. cluster node catches it. This proxy uses rules to divert the data from a virtual IP to a relevant port. So okay. when we send a request, the data is chopped into packets, each having an IP heading, right? And uh, this heading is altered to a process called network address translation. We, we call it NAT. Everybody knows yeah. NAT, yeah. Uh, which change the IP heading, IP address in the heading. Uh, as this change occurs for every packet, it can slow things down when many packets need to alter it. Uh, to improve this performance, uh, mm -hmm. Cilium. Cilium is an open source uh, CNCF project, mm -hmm. uh, offer, offers a different method called socket based load balance. Right. Here, uh, Cilium makes a uh, listening socket linked to a service IP. So, as a packet uh, arrived, Cilium checked them to decide where to send them and uses EPVF to steer the packet to a correct socket. I see. And this only happened per connection, not for every packet, which makes right. the network work faster. Okay. So that improves the, the performance of uh, Kubernetes exactly. networking, right? Right. Yeah. What about the scalability side? So how do how do uh, eBPF address the, the scalability side on that one? So that's also coming with the same concept. So when mm -hmm. we're having, we can, when you can handle the uh, uh, low latency uh, network, so mm -hmm. it can scale a much uh, larger number of nodes. So right. earlier case with the cook proxy, uh, it's mm -hmm. like uh, can't handle the much uh, throughput. So right. it's scalable is lesser. Less, okay. Right. So next I was, I'm gonna ask you like, um, can we also use eBPF to enhance the security? Because I mean, this is something that keeps coming up in the Kubernetes world, right? Uh, enhance the security of Kubernetes applications. Yes, exactly. So EBF uh, like uh, can improve the security of Kubernetes application. Like it, it helping keep our communication and the uh, data very safe. So uh, usually, network security users IP addresses to decide who get access. Right. It's like uh, having a special key for each device. Like, uh, but uh, people can trick the system and change this IP address. Uh, which is a problem in a system like Kubernetes where the IP addresses can often change. Yes. So EPF work differently. It uses identity-based policies, making mm -hmm. like a decisions based on the port's specific detail like labels and annotation, mm -hmm. not just its IP addresses. Right. I think uh, we can think of like a security guard who doesn't just rely on ID card, but also personally know each individual. So when a port send a packet, EPF functions like a security card, right. check the port's individual details. Right. So based on this assessment, like it decides whether the port should be granted the access to the service, thus like a providing a level of control in both precise and the secure. Right, right. So regardless of the IP address changes, it doesn't matter as far as the right identity is, it's the one that's going to access it, right? Yes, it's inbuilt to the packet. So it's you can't change the identity in that case. Yeah, yeah. Which makes sense in the Kubernetes world, right? When ever keep on changing the IP address whenever you start, restart a pod, et cetera, right? Yes, that's, that's the main advantage having this uh, identity base uh, uh, like a firewalls. Yeah. So next one is kind of leading from there. So one of the other key things in Kubernetes as well as in the Kubernetes world is the observability, right? Observability is very crucial, right? And yeah. can you elaborate how we could poss possibly use eBPF in this domain? Yeah, so uh, if you look at the observability, like uh, helps us to understand system behavior, like uh, using data like metrics, logs and traces, right? So the traditional way to do this in all manual adding code together this analysis and analyze the data, which can be a complex and also time consuming. Right. A popular method in microservices is using a service mesh with the sidecar proxies. Mm -hmm. Like these proxies automatically collect and analyze data, giving insight to application behavior. But running a separate proxy for each service can slow things down 
and also use more resources. Yeah. So EP5 offer better solution for a service mesh environment. Mm -hmm. So it's allow data collection at the kernel level, meaning uh, no need for separate boxes serving and saving resources and reducing overhead. So EP5 can capture network traffic, check and modify packets, mm -hmm. and also generate data for centralized analysis. And right. this gives a deeper understanding of application behavior and also infrastructure without an extra work of a sidecar proxy. Right, right. Uh, the tools like Pixie, Hubble uh, use a EPPF technology for better observability in uh, modern cloud native environments. Right, right. Is Hubble the, the one that the Cilium project that you mentioned earlier? Yes. From yeah. The, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, we talk a bit about you know the the use of it you know what it stands for etc now um you know this significant popularity like ebfef in the recent days right i mean you and i probably know the bp bpf actually was long running yeah. project right can you discuss a little bit about that like and um you know in, especially in the cloud native application architecture you know and linux kernel ecosystem right. sure yeah i think the most of uh cloud infrastructure like uh, over 90 percent runs on linux kernel uh, because it's strong stable and dependable right so we we, yeah. we all our servers running on uh, linux servers uh, so it's allowed application to run and share resource efficiently so however that apps are quickly changing we all know that cloud native apps are changing very rapidly Absolutely. so it yeah. need more functionality from the kernel traditionally we only had two choices one chain the kernel source and wait for the Linux community to include your changes and which could take a year. Right, right. Second okay. option, yeah. yeah. So, and the second option, uh, uh, write a kernel module, uh, mm -hmm. but this may need a regular fixing as each new kernel release could break it. Yeah. So, uh, these challenges made it to evolve the modern like uh, cloud native application, like, uh, uh, but now, with the EBPA, we can have a new option. Mm -hmm. It's allow us to change how the Linux kernel behave without mm -hmm. needing to change the source code or loading a kernel module. I see, I see. So that's a massive advantage over the kernel modules and having to wait for the new releases to come yes, out. Yes, right? that changed the uh, cloud native application world dramatically. Now, um, in terms of the, all these, what do you, why do you think um, you know, people should look at a platform to provide this capability versus building something yourself? The, the reason I'm asking that question is, I mean, eBPF is a heavy technical um, you know, solution, right? I'm not saying that one cannot do it with it, but what are the advantages like of somebody using a platform versus kind of going and building your own one? Yeah, absolutely. This is a very important question. Uh, the, uh, so building complex tools like even EPPF or programmable data pen can be tough and time consuming. Yeah, That's why the, some people are choose to use a ready-made platform, right, instead. So uh, this platform are simpler because uh, experts have already built and tested them. And they let you focus on making your app instead of worrying up these infrastructures. Right. They they also designed to grow easily with your user base, mm -hmm. and the plus point they come yep. with the maintenance and support, like which include bug fixers and keep him up with the new tech. Right. But so, uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but can't you like uh, sometimes a ready-made platform might not sure might 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 not suit suit to your specific need or cloud, mm -hmm. but could be uh, costly, right? Right. Uh, so. Uh, you know that cloud cost, right? Uh, it can Absolutely. be keep keep increasing. Keep increasing, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So also, it might not give you a control you would have if you build something yourself. Yeah. So you should decide whether to use the cloud platform or not by considering your specific needs, the resource you have, your expertise, and what trade-off you are willing to accept. Right, right. And continue to maintain it as well, right? Because, I mean, you can get anything up into production, but day two, day three operations also very key, right? right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. 
So um, next one is kind of leading into it as well, like in terms of the challenges, right? So what are some of the challenges that you have seen and the others have seen in the BPA? And how would you recommend people would overcome some of these challenges? Yeah, I think I can think of three main challenges. Firstly, uh, the complexity. So EPFA can be tricky to use, especially if you are not very familiar with Linux. So however, uh, uh, they are, uh, there are handy tools like BCC and LibBFA, which make EPFA easy to navigate. Mm -hmm. Even better, uh, we have tools like Cilium, BFF Trace that incorporate EPFF to help us further. Right. I think second point is there's a issue of kernel compatibility. Mm -hmm. So EPFF need to be up, up to date with Linux kernel function properly. Right. Uh, this means we need to keep your kernel updated and stay informed about what your kernel can do or can't do with EPFF. Right. It's updating is an, an option. Mm -hmm. Then we may ha uh, have some limitation on using EPPF. I, I, I think the last point, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we must consider secure risk. Although EPPF is designed to be secure and safer, mm -hmm. yep. having a uh, customized code running uh, kernel, it could pose a risk, right? Uh, so we need to make sure that our EPPF code is reviewed and follow mm -hmm safety protocols. I see. Right. Also, uh, remember always install any security updates like uh, uh, for your kernel and EPF tools. Right. I think these are the things we need to keep in mind while working with EPF. I see. Right. So these challenges can be possibly overcome with the, the platform approach, isn't it? Yes. Because you I have think... more support and more experts working on it to help you rather than you trying to build something yourself, right? Yes. yes, I think uh, when you're when you're working with uh, specific tools, we have to uh, platform approach is very important because uh, that people are like, keep doing the same thing and they they become experts on that. I think yes. that helps a lot, like uh, to maintain these platforms. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and um, lastly, what would what advice would you give someone who is interested in learning more about EBPF, whether to build something themselves or whether to, you know, get to know what are the benefits, et cetera. What advice would yeah. you give learning yeah, specifically? I, yeah. yeah, I think first uh, start with basic, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. understand the EPF and how it's work, it's in high level. And basic understanding of Linux and system programming will be uh, much helpful. And my recommendation, first visit the EPFF.io it is mm -hmm. the best place to start. Right. And second, I can think of like a hands-on learning. Like a, once you got a grasp of basics, start mm -hmm. experimenting with EPF on your own. Right. Like there right. are many tutorials, example available online. Like you, for instance, the BCC repository on GitHub. Uh, mm -hmm. GitHub, it has a lot of sample EPF programs that you can try running and modifying and see how they work. I see. And third, uh, use tools and libraries. So basically writing raw EBPF code can be difficult, right? Uh, right? But thankfully there are tools, libraries available, so it makes easier to write the code. And the, another important thing is to participate in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, the EPFF community is vibrant and growing. And there are many resources available like blogs, talks, and online forums where you can ask questions and learn from others. Have and you yourself? So, sorry, uh, Lakma. No, go ahead, Kanchana. Yeah. I was going to say, have you been involved with a lot of these communities as well, right? Yes, and actually, I, 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 I started learning. I, I follow the same steps I, I just typed yeah. uh, when I knew to the EBFF. I, look at the basics and then uh, make my hand dirty with the tutorials and engage with the community. Yeah, so I think the same things was uh, I followed the, when I learned the EPPA. And one important thing, Kanchan, like uh, yeah. uh, learning EPPA is not just about understanding the technology, but yeah. also about knowing when and how to use effectively. Absolutely. So as you gain experience and try try to apply EPPF to real world problem and see how it can add value to your uh, your use cases. 100%, 100%, yeah. 
Uh, any any last comments you wanted to leave for the people who are trying to learn and get to know about EBPF? I think this uh, EBPF is a very uh, uh, new technology and uh, interesting technology. Uh, like uh, uh, we can do much more things than what we're doing now. So right. I think uh, I, I, I encourage everyone to look at the technology and uh, uh, try to use it and see what are the potential you can make out of it. Now, Lakmal, thank you so much. And uh, it was an absolute pleasure again to talk to you and uh, an awesome article. I think if people who have not read it, um, I, we will republish it. And it's on the WSO2 website as well as it shared by many social media as well. Thank you so much, Lakmal. We'll soon talk a little bit more about EBPF in a couple of more months. Uh -huh.